From Townsville's humble beginnings in 1864 to the present day, the city has experienced a growth rate that rivalled other centres in the north. John Melton Black, employed by Robert Towns at Woodstock Station, dispatched Andrew Ball, Mark Watt Reed and a small party of Aboriginals to search for a site where a suitable port could be established. Ball's party reached the mouth of Ross Creek in April 1864, setting up a camp below the rocky spur of Melton Hill near the present Customs House on the Strand. After further exploration of the surrounding area, Ball returned to Woodstock Station and reported discovery of a favourable site for the settlement. So Townsville was born, and with it came the construction of some of the iconic residences, many of which are still standing today. Early construction of buildings in Townsville fell to two main firms, Tunbridge Architects and local hardware merchants Rooney and Company. The firm owes its establishment to the work and foresight of three young Irishmen named Rooney, with the biblical Christian names of John, Jacob and Matthew. Renowned local historian and published author, Dr Dorothy Gibson Wilde explains the early days of Tunbridge and Rooney's involvement in the construction of Townsville. From their first firm, we're not quite sure where it was, but that opened in 1872 and they moved down further down East Flinders Street and that was their major factory for furniture man making and also for building construction and they also had a timber mill there but it was too small so then they transferred to railway estate and it was there that so much of the timber for North Queensland houses and public buildings whatever that was milled and they would bring the logs in from all over the place including in from the west coast of America, they would bring logs in and they would be cut into timber, whatever size of timber, they had different milling machines and that was done on the, in that mill later on the South, uh, railway estate rather, and um, in East Flinders Street early on. And then of course they moved into prefabrication and they were the earliest firm in North Queensland to make prefabricated buildings. Prior to that they all came from the south, particularly from Maryborough. So um, Rooney's were a very important firm and they are extremely important in the economy of North Queensland. Local resident Jerry Reeves has been working as a carpenter in Townsville for over 70 years. He prides himself in keeping traditional skills alive in his garbit workshop. Jerry, you were born here in Townsville in 1928? Born in McKillop Street, Melbourne Gardens, Townsville. And you've worked on the tools as a carpenter joiner for about 70 years now? And just about. Just about? Just about. And your dad before you? Was... He started the business on the 1st of February 1931. And you were telling me about the machinery. In You moved most of the machinery to this shed about 25 years ago? That's right. When your dad passed away? mum and away. dad passed away. Yeah. Well, originally in the old workshop, we had two motors that drove the whole workshop through line shafts on, on the ceiling with belt feed down to every machine. And every machine run eight hours a day. When I shifted out here, every, every machine had to be motorised. It was a pretty big job. But a lot of them, so a lot of the machinery in this shed today is about 80 or 90 years old. Well, that's some of them would be over 100. Some of them over 100. Yeah, yeah. And and you still work on all those machines now? That's right. And you do all the mortise and tenon joints and everything the way they were done? The proper way. Well, the male machinery, as I say, it's, it's just as good as any. You've got the tenon machine that cuts the tenon machine, cuts the tenon. You've got the mortise machine that does the mortise. You've got the spindle moulders that, that uh, mould it for whatever shape you might want to be doing, whether it's for joinery or mouldings. And uh, it's virtually the same as what the, the, all the new stuff is, only it's just not as modern. But it does just as good a job. Well, all the material we used was northern, northern softwoods, mostly silky oak or maple. Uh, the best, best floor of the trade. Uh, occasionally a bit of cedar, which was very hard to get at the time. Uh, they cut it all out in many years before that. And uh, I've, I've used uh, silky oak exclusively just about ever since. 
I uh, started my apprenticeship at 15. I did a normal five years course and then a, a post apprentice course after to allow you to be a foreman or anything like that. And a uh, total of six years or six and a half years, something like that. Where the boys today, if they've done a senior, they only do three years and they, and they don't learn anything. We have to do it and do it properly or you didn't, you didn't have a job, that's all that we were doing. Well, there's nobody to hand it down. Fortunately, there's nobody to hand it down. My youngest son is a, is a fitter and turner, works at the town for General Hospital as maintenance there. And my eldest boy is a, a, a contractor of electrician. Uh, there's nobody to follow me on. Uh, what happens then, I don't know. Mortise and tenon joints were a key component in the construction of early buildings in Townsville. Today we are going to see how these joints are made using a combination of hand and electric tools. First the timber is selected for the straightness of the grain and the carpenter carefully avoids sections with knots and other imperfections. The timber is then marked out using a pencil and square. Then the hole or mortise is roughly drilled out using a one inch spade bit. This is drilled deep enough to accommodate the tenon. After the holes have been drilled to the required depth, the remainder of the waste material is removed using a 25 millimeter chisel. After the rough work has been completed, the mortise is given a final trim to ensure the tenon fits tightly. Now the mortise is complete, it is time to mark out the tenon which forms the other half of the joint. Once again we use the square ruler and pencil to mark the cuts. Next, a handsaw is used to remove the waste material from around the tenon. Now that the two halves of the joint have been completed, it's time to put the two halves together. A perfect fit. Now all that remains is to glue and nail the joint for years of reliability. Most heritage properties in the north feature some sort of decorative wood turning in their design. The addition of these ornaments is said to harken back to colonial English days and the concept of share farming. Share farming was big business in old England. If you were lucky enough to own a manor house with extensive land holdings, you needed workers to make it pay. So portions of land were given to peasants to farm and in return they received a share of the crop to sell and therefore ensure survival. Problem was that share farming peasants weren't always grateful for this often inequitable relationship. They stayed poor as the lord of the manor grew fat and wealthy. He didn't want these workers to get any ideas about land redistribution, so he ruled his miniature kingdom with an iron fist. If someone broke the law on the estate, the Lord would exact retribution. Execution was a favourite form of punishment. Severing heads per Henry VIII and his wives was once in vogue. But the Lord wanted everyone passing by to feel his wrath. So he took the head, dipped it in hot tar, and impaled it on a stake in some high-profile location. The roof of the manor was a prime position, therefore a suitable stake had to be manufactured to display the heads of the wrongdoers. 
the ball-shaped finial, or acorn, perhaps display more vividly the original finial and the addition of a badly behaved peasant's head. In modern times, the finial is a purely decorative piece of architecture. However, no colonial property is considered complete without one or more of these wooden features in place. Replacement of these decorations is a fairly simple process. It utilises a straightforward measuring process and then some skillful turning on a wood lathe. Let's have a look at the process involved in manufacturing a set of replacement finials. First, accurate measurements are taken of the existing finial and transferred to a plastic template. Then, timber is selected, centred and placed between the centres on the lathe. In earlier times, lathes would have been powered by a foot pedal with the rotational speed being governed by the leg strength of the operator. Now, a modern electric lathe completes the task with only a little effort required by the operator. Once the timber is selected, it is inserted in the lathe, centred and the turning begins. After the turning and sanding is complete, the acorn finial is ready for painting and refitting to the stairway. Next, we move on to the remanufacturing of the rooftop finial.
With the final sand, the rooftop finial is complete and ready to be painted and fitted. Most heritage properties in North Queensland suffer from exposure to the elements. By utilising traditional skills and more modern machinery, replacement components can be manufactured to keep the houses in good repair. Today we're going to manufacture a timber veranda bracket. The first step is to trace the design of the veranda bracket onto paper and then select suitable timber. Once again the timber should be clear of knots and imperfections. Next carbon paper is used to transfer the design to the timber. When the tracing is complete, the carbon paper and the template is removed to reveal the timber marked up ready for cutting.
the cutting out of the design is now ready to begin. In earlier days, a manual pedal-powered scroll saw may have been used to complete the cutting out of the design. Now, an electric scroll saw completes the cutting with ease. Holes are drilled to facilitate the internal cuts and the cutting out begins. Once all the cutouts have been completed, the bracket is ready for sanding, painting and installation.